this morning. We're going to talk about a subject that seems to be of some controversy within the church as a whole, especially in America, but really all over the world today. Is church attendance required with all this COVID-19 virus going on? It has divided congregations. It has divided brothers and sisters. It has divided the church in some ways. But what we need to remember is maybe this could be a way to unify the church and congregations and brothers and sisters. It depends on our attitude and our understanding God's Word this morning. I'm going to I'm going to try to answer the question. Does the New Testament teach that Christians must be present at every meeting of the church? As a matter of fact, is that the only way we can worship God? The whole sermon centers around the beginning here. Where is your heart? Does the New Testament teach that Christians must be present at every meeting of the church. This is not a question that could be answered yes or no, but maybe this little saying will help us all understand the basis of this sermon. A man being in a chicken house does not make the man a chicken. And a man being in the church building does not make a man worthy of God, a Christian, in full faith. There seems to be two extreme thoughts today concerning our absence. To this question, we know that extremisms, extremisms often think beyond what is written in the Bible. Whatever extreme view that you have, if it goes beyond or less than what the Bible teaches, then we're not going by the Bible, are we? So we must not go beyond what is written. That's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Don't go beyond what's written. Don't try to read into something or come up with, I think, I believe, or I feel. Thought one, as far as extreme, could be described like this. If you miss any gathering of the church, you're not a faithful child of God. In fact, you're either lost or you're about to be lost. Well, that is an extreme. There is no room at all in this kind of thinking for missing unless maybe one's on his deathbed. Everything else would just be considered an excuse. An excuse not to be here. We're going to extremes to understand what might be going on in the minds of many today. Thought two might be, if you go on the first day of the week, this is the other end of the extreme. If you go on the first day of the week, at least to partake of the Lord's Supper, well, in remembrance of the death of our Savior and Lord, then you're just fine. That's all you really need to do. This kind of thinking also is an extreme. I showed up. Uh, it's an attitude of, look, I punched the clock this week. I went. Uh, I was there. I'm a faithful member of the Lord's church. I usually go. That is extreme thinking. There's a sense of urgency that is taught in the book of Hebrews. The letter was written perhaps about 30 years after the establishment of the church on the first day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The inspired writer of Hebrews, the document was warning the Jewish Christians, those that had obeyed the teachings of Jesus. Some of these saints were being encouraged by Hebrew false teachers to abandon Christianity. What you learn, fall away from it, in other words, and revert back to Judaism. The disciples were cautioned against drifting from the truth. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. 
It says, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest we drift away and developing an evil heart of unbelief. In other words, falling away from the living God. Hebrews 3.12 we're all at any given time. Oh, you beware ye that think you stand lest you fall. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Listen, we can all become weak and we don't need to use this time and these circumstances in our nation of this virus to weaken us lest we fall away. They are admonished to throw off their dullness of hearing. Hebrews 5, 11. Their ears were becoming deaf. And to hold on to the boldness and the patience and, and to the very endurance to the end. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. Stay strong in your faith. With this background in mind, let us think of, this, of these great verses and its encouragement to help us remain faithful. All of us worldwide in this congregation in our nation and with each other. We need to attend to listen to God's word so that we can keep ourselves strong in the faith to the end. And an encouragement to exhort one another. Perhaps the most controversial passage relating to the matter of attendance is Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 through 25. But before we consider the text, perhaps some background would be helpful before we get into this verse 24 and 25. First of all, in chapter 10, verse 22 and 23, let's look at that. It says, let us draw near with a true heart. Back to the heart. Where's your heart? Where is your love? Where do you want to be? Worshiping? in spirit and in truth, worshiping God, in full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. He who is promised is faithful. I want my confession of hope without wavering. I want to be strong. So what am I supposed to do as I draw near with a true heart? This is a very, very important part of attendance. I want you, before I read these verses and go over them, to think of this. Can I do this other than the church building? Yes, you can. But remember this, every one of us here are all brothers and sisters, all the family of God. And we need to come together to help all the family of God, not just one or two or three that we might be gathering with. We all need encouragement, don't we? So let us consider one another in order to do what? Stir up love and good works. Is that what's going on today? Well, it is, but there's also some dissension going on, some confusion. We're not told to have dissension and confusion. We're told to stir up love and good works not forsaking our assembling together. It does not say, do not forsake the assembly. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the practice of the uh, some is, but exhorting one another in so much more as we see the day drawing near. Exhort, what does that mean? It's, it's a strong encouragement. And listen, I need it from you. You need it from each other. You need it from me. We need each other to encourage us. We need encouragement. I need to walk through those doors and when I walk back out, feel encouraged and, I, and also have the mindset that I help encourage other brothers and sisters. That is a very big part of coming together. First, these Christians were to consider one another. Not just your buddy, not just a group, the whole family. When children of God have a proper consideration for one another, we really love each other. They will provoke each other to what? 
love and good works. We don't need to come and murmur and, and talk about those that are here, those that are not here, talk about the ones that are here and shouldn't be. No. We need to provoke each other, spurring up each other, encouraging one another. And the best way to do that really is in, per, in, in person. But let's talk about this forsaking to assemble. Forsaking in this, this verse is a practice that is repeated. You're not, you're not showing up over and over and over all of a sudden for one reason or another and maybe some of them are real, maybe some of them are good, and maybe some of them aren't. The phraseology here does not describe, as uh, some have argued once, and for all time you've abandoned uh, the apostasy, uh, you've abandoned the faith, you've fallen away from God, you're gone. No, you're, you're, you're practicing not coming together, but you've not completely fallen away from God. 1 Corinthians 10.29 helps us to understand this just a little bit better. It speaks of the conscience. Conscience, I say, not thine own conscience, but of the other, of those others. The ones that are here, not of the, we're not judging the conscience of the ones that aren't here. The ones that aren't here are not judging the conscience of the ones that are here. Uh, but why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Hmm. Or what is in his heart? You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, James chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, that will give you some clarity on this, judging the other person's conscience. Rather, it is depicted, this forsaking, what had become a customary habit to many. They just were not assembling together to encourage one another in the faith, to build each other up into which some of the Hebrew saints had fallen. They had fallen. They were getting weaker and weaker because they weren't assembling together, which could lead to total apostasy. It could. They weren't already in apostasy, but it could certainly lead to it. If a correction were not made, the, strong, the term strongly emphasizes the disregard for the family of God, the others that need our encouragement. That's one of the reasons we're to assemble is to stir up love and good works, encourage one another. That characterizes some children of God. In this case, those who persistently, without valid reasons, actually neglect, neglect church meetings. Hmm. You know, some of the Jewish Christians had gotten into the habit of excusing themselves from the meetings of the church, perhaps as a result at that time of fear or persecution. Uh, maybe, and maybe today as well, they got tied up into materialistic pursuits. I'd rather do this. The world offers me time to do this and I'm not going to be able to go to church today because I want to do this, that, or the other. That is not a real reason to not be here. Or downright laziness, if you want to know the truth. Finally, the author of Hebrews changes gears. He really puts it into gear when he says, and do this so much more as the day is drawing near. What day? Many conclude that since this book was written not long before the horrible destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, as there were visible signs to identify the imminence of this event. Matthew 24, it says, this may be what the writer had in view. Talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Maybe that is as the day approaches. But we could apply this also in our time to the destruction of our own body in this life, couldn't it? Which may be tomorrow. It may be today. So we need to encourage one another, encourage each other much, much more as the day approaches. We cannot get weak especially in our old years, and lose our faith. Is missing a service actually forsaking? That might be what we really need to dwell on in the negative part of this lesson. There are various extremes which, with reference to the church attendance. So between these two extremes, 
actually lies the truth. If you miss, you're not you're you're, you're falling away. You're not going to heaven. You're you used an excuse. How do you know he used an excuse? On the other end, y'all shouldn't be there. Uh, you don't care about each other. You're showing up anyway. Well, both of you are going to an extreme. You don't judge what I have in my heart. I can't judge what you've got in your heart. I can't judge your conscience. And you can't judge mine. What I feel is right, I'll be judged one day and it won't be with you. As far as the services, other than the time set in Acts chapter 20 verse 7, on the first day of the week as you come together to break bread. That's what it says. Well, I want to come on Saturday. On the first, I want to come on Monday. I want to come on the first day of the week. That's what Scripture says. And I want to hear a sermon. Maybe it'll mean that. They are to accommodate the spiritual needs of the majority when other times other than the first day of the week are said. By implication, actually, by, by setting up other services like a, a Sunday evening or a Wednesday evening or a special Bible study any time during the week. Well, that's what we want to do. The problem is, everybody can't do that. I wrote down there, by implication, this will deprive a minority from assembling on that special occasion. They just can't. So, shall we conclude with one mindset that when we're forced to miss some of the service, some of the services that were apostates, we have fallen away. We're not worthy to be called a Christian anymore because I missed. Well, that is absurd, isn't it? Moreover, it's a reality of life. Not everybody has the education or the opportunities to get that wonderful nine to five job Monday through Friday. So when special services are set up, well, he still has to make a living, or she does. Uh, you're worse than an infidel if you don't help provide for your own family. So with this kind of thinking, it would be a lose-lose situation. We don't want to get into that. That would be absurd. It would be an extreme. Some who truly love the Lord and are devoted to his cause must work at some times and they cannot be here. Surely it will be acknowledged that one could remain at home if you had to care for the sick or if you were sick, not on your deathbed. We can list several reasons why one would honestly have to miss the assembly at church. I like to throw this one in as a preacher. I'm on my way to church. I see some old, feeble person on the side of the road that broke down. I stop. I ask them how I can help. Uh, I have to get to the hospital. My tire is flat. I don't know what I'm going to do. And they're crying. Would my answer be, I'll help you now. And now that may make me late. It may be may that I don't show up here on time or even show up. Or I could say, I tell you what, as soon as I get through with services at church, I'll come back and see if I can help you. We have to use common sense. Somewhere in the middle, I could say of all these extremes, is the truth. The truth is frequently church service delinquency, and it is a heart problem, however. That's the other side of this. The Lord's kingdom is not first in some saints' lives as taught in Matthew 6, 33. With some people, they just don't want to be here. Not because they can't. They just don't. <clears throat> some that might be in every service, however, we're going to look on, you know I say there's two sides to every, every hand. We're going to look the other side for just a second. Some that might be in every service and yet not have their heart right while they're here and see no need to stir up love as it teaches in verse 24 of Hebrews 10 or will not even pay attention to what's going on and they're not listening to Hebrews 10 22 which says let us draw near with a true heart I want to be here I'm not just punching the clock I come to worship God and stir up love and good works but they're coming not with a 
true heart in full assurance of faith, not having their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. In fact, they may be carrying anger inside of them. And our bodies washed with pure water, they're not paying attention to that verse. You know, those, even though they might be here every time the doors open, can be a stumbling block if their thoughts and actions hold an extreme view over the real reason why we assemble. The key to this entire lesson is to bring us into full understanding. Understanding. Well, I know it all. If you know it all, you're the only person on earth other than Christ that knows it all. In full understanding of attendance so that we can be in unity with one another. This time needs to be some time in our life where we come together in mind and spirit and in attendance anytime possible. And what we're going to do then is become unified. The church needs to be unified worldwide. <clears throat> Whether one misses services or is attending services, it must be for the right reason. And I have to ask myself, who am I to judge? Romans 14, 10 says, But why do you judge your brother John? Or why do you show contempt for your brother John? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. John, it don't really have John in there, but it's speaking to me as well as it is to you. Righteous judgment is God's job. He will see who's righteous because He is a just God and He knows our hearts. He knows our consciences. We can't lie to God, can we? Jeremiah 17, 10 states this. I, the Lord, teach the heart and test the mind. John, you don't have to worry about it, son. To give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his deeds, whether good or bad, evil or good, we're going to be judged on the last day. So I have to make sure in my mind, in my conscience, and in my heart, one, that I need to be here, and if I'm not here, it's, it's because I really can't, God understands completely. But also, if I am here, my heart, my mind, and my soul is in right order. I've come to gather around the table and remember my Savior. I've come to sing songs and praises to God and teach, admonish, teach and admonish one another. As the family of God, I've come to listen to words and a sermon and a lesson from God's Word. I've learned, I've learned that I want to come together to grow and, and encourage and admonish my brothers and sisters and show my love for them and, and build up love and good works and for them to do the same with me. Well, I want to be here if I can. And God knows that. He will judge me on the last day. Romans 14, 12 and 13 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We will. 